The really bad news is that, unbeknownst to the appeals court, they had just awarded me to the care and custody of a pedophile. We had a beautiful three-story Victorian home that we lived in. On the weekends, we went to our lake house. And back in those days, I don't have one single memory of an anxious or a fearful or even an unhappy thought. I was six years old when they called me into a room one day and explained that they were my aunt and uncle and I had a completely different family in another city. And that was the day that I was going to go live with that family, they told me. So that day, they packed my belongings and we got into the car. My aunt and uncle drove up, took my bags out of the car, and very tearfully and painfully set them in the living room, turned around, and walked out of my life forever. This um, poverty-stricken situation was frightening. It was, it was scary. And not long after I was dropped off, my mother ran away from home quite unexpectedly. We had no idea where she was. My mother was gone for about a year. She had, uh, was mentally ill. She'd had a nervous breakdown when I was born, and that is why I was even given up to my aunt and uncle in the first place. She suspected that my father had, was a pedophile. And she also suspected that Clayton, my father's best friend, was a pedophile as well. And he was. My father gave me over, and almost every weekend, I would spend the weekend at Clayton's apartment, which was just across the street from our family's apartment, surrounded by mountains of pornography, being molested. Clayton could have his way and do whatever he wanted to. Shortly after that, we found that my mother was dead in a San Antonio hotel room. She had taken her own life. The idea of me being molested without her ability to stop it was just more than she could stand. My dad moved us into the slum house in the fringes of one of Texas's wealthiest school districts. And it was filthy and dirty, filled with cockroaches, and I was so ashamed to live there. I started meeting wealthy kids and looking at their homes and visiting their homes and seeing how they lived. I started borrowing their clothes, sometimes stealing their clothes. I became a cheerleader at, in, in high school. Uh, even though I was living this double life. I was dating a, a football player, and it wasn't long before I became pregnant. It did not cross my mind to have that baby. Many of my friends were having abortions, and to me it was just an, a, a fearful inconvenience and something I needed to get rid of as soon as possible. After high school, I uh, went on to college. I was in California when I got word that my dad was desperately ill. I rushed home to San Antonio, and he was dying. And I stood there and I watched him draw his last breath. And I looked up at the clock and I realized the finality of it. He's gone. And I was without my father, my mother. I had no grandparents on either side. And I felt so alone and so abandoned by God. And I was so angry at God. And I was so afraid. I didn't think I could take care of myself. I felt like I needed someone to come rescue me and take care of me. And so I reached out, like so many women do in this predicament, and I got married. I married a brutal, abusive, very angry man who was a former amateur boxer from the south side of Chicago. And I was just living out my mother's life of marrying this abusive man. We had a child, and he abused me uh, and my son. He would tell me uh, at night before we went to bed that he was going to rape me that night, and he would follow through on that promise. He um, would be abusing our son to the point that I really didn't know whether I was going to lose him or not. The only way I knew to cope was to just not feel. The things that would bring many people to tears wouldn't bring me to tears because I couldn't afford to have tears because I don't know that I could ever stop crying. And so after a 20 years of an abusive marriage that led almost to me losing 
my life because of being so depressed, I divorced. I was at a low point in my life. I was so afraid. It's about that time that I discovered Hope for the Heart and Hope for the Heart's resources. And amazingly, I began to discover things like books on codependency. I realized that's my problem. Boundaries, domestic violence, wife abuse, fear, anxiety, depression, all of these things I started reading about. I started listening to June when she was on the air, but then I started getting involved in small groups. I remember the first one was for victims of childhood sexual abuse. Another thing that changed my life was abortion recovery. I didn't know that I was suffering from the abortion that I had had decades ago. I didn't know that the, the, the guilt and the shame and even a lot of the fear that I felt was from that abortion until I got in that weekend and God began to show it to me and to begin to cleanse me. And, and for, I felt His forgiveness and I felt His acceptance and I felt finally that I was free and that I could walk with Him and believe His promises and that they were for me. And as I started to walk with God's people in this healing day after day, month after month, immersing myself in, in all of Hope for the Heart's resources, the healing started to happen. I work at a church now where I work in the care and support area where we reach out to people and, and hold groups for care and recovery and support. And God is using my life and taking the things that were so evil that happened in my life and using them for good. And for that, I praise Him and I'm so grateful for Hope for the Heart for helping me.